What does the information actually tell us about what is going on then? Well, the, it's a real treasure trove of different documents. There are hundreds of them, uh, of them apparently, and that does suggest that it probably is a leak. Um, if somebody was fabricating a document uh, for the purposes of misinformation, they'd probably only produce one or two, but not not hundreds. And, and the content goes well beyond Ukraine. Uh, for example, it's uh, U.S. observations about uh, Israel and the activities of Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service, um, and U.S. relations with South Korea and so on. So it looks a little bit like uh, WikiLeaks. You remember that, Ed, the 700,000 U.S classified documents that, that were uh, dumped uh, back in 2013. But as far as Ukraine is concerned, it, it gives the US assessment of the situation, for example, casualties on the Ukrainian side, on the Russian side, uh, which uh, the US is disputing. So there could have been a bit of doctrine of, the doc, uh, of those documents in places. Uh, and also talks about the rather parlous state of Ukrainian air defense, now that they've fired uh, very many of the missiles which they've had uh, in their arsenal in the past. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it thinks. It, I mean, worryingly for those of us, obviously, most of us who want Ukraine, obviously, to win, uh, it does show that um, the Ukrainian army is short of uh, weapons and other munitions. It's having to be very careful about where it play, play, uh, places its um, uh, air defences uh, as well. But it does show as well how closely the US is working with your Ukrainian military authorities uh, in terms of being able to warn them of Russian missile strikes. Yes, no, absolutely. And I, I suppose that really isn't a big secret because I think we've all guessed for some time that the United States and other allies were giving Ukraine lots of intelligence, particularly on Russian troop movements. Mm. Um, that's obviously also helped uh, the Ukrainians to use this long range artillery like HIMARS, uh, mm. the system that the Americans have given them uh, to best effect to sort of... Uh, try to attack you know, Russian ammunition dumps and command and, tr uh, and control centers, uh, airfields and so on uh, in the rear. So I don't suppose that's going to come as a surprise to anyone. Also, the documents, uh, thank God, uh, when it comes to a leak, are a month old or uh, 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 longer. So uh, that means that the uh, the sort of hot operational intelligence uh, in them is, is of, of limited uh, value. But nonetheless, it's still embarrassing that all of this stuff comes out. Uh, the Justice Department in the United States is going to run an, uh, an investigation and we'll, we'll see if we get any clarity uh, in the future as to whether it's a, a leak that's occurred in the US or uh, or somewhere else. But I mean, the, it does feel I, like a leak yeah. from, a, from a hostile power, which I guess would, would the, the most worrying thing, given that these are a month old, would be uh, whether or not there'll be further leaks uh, and whether US intelligence has been compromised in a, in a fundamental way. Well, let, let's hope not. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been there before with the US and uh, some of it will be more embarrassing than, than really hurtful from an intelligence point of view, like the revelation apparently in one of the documents that uh, the US believed that Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service, was you know, actively supporting the demonstrations against the, uh, the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu at the moment, so obviously over the, uh, the various uh, legal reforms. So more embarrassment sometimes than a big compromise. But again, it does show that particularly in the US system, uh, far too many people are potentially on the receiving end of classified information. I mean, this was the big issue, of course, with WikiLeaks, said you mm. recall back in 2013. Uh, and there is obviously going to be a need for all everybody to sort of tighten up the distribution of this kind of material. Um, you've been with NATO, you were with NATO for years and years and years. What kind of state uh, do you think NATO is at at the moment, I mean, I feel extremely optimistic about the direction of travel for NATO at the moment, but you obviously know many people who still work there. Well, yes, I, I mean, obviously, you know, collective defence has always been uh, NATO's DNA. That's what it was created to do back in uh, 1949, the collective defence of Europe. And that's something that everybody in NATO signs up to. It's not like Afghanistan, Ed, or some of the other so-called out-of-area operations where some allies were passionate believers in the global war against terror, uh, and others were less enthusiastic and where participation was voluntary. Here, here, all of the allies are participating. You just saw that Finland joined NATO last week as the 31st member state. Who would have thought that before mm. Putin invaded Ukraine with Sweden to follow? But, but obviously,
obviously, you know, with, with uh, uh, a new sort of lease of life, it had come lots of challenges. And, you know, NATO hasn't actually had to really worry about fighting Russia mm. uh, since the end of the Cold War. Now it does have to worry about that. It may not be an immediate prospect, but it's no longer unthinkable. And so as NATO heads up to its next summit in, in Vilnius, which is going to be this July, it has to look at all of its defence plans, its reinforcement plans, its command structure, um, its, you know, ammunition reserves, its industrial production and say, look, you know, if we had to fight tomorrow, are we really prepared to do it? Um, so that's, I think, going to be the, the test in the months ahead. And get ready to welcome Ben Wallace as the new Secretary General. Well, who knows? Uh, you know, Jamie. Come on. No, I, I honestly <laughs> don't. And I, I wish I'd love to be able to give time for radio a scoop because you, you, you might invite me back in the future. But I definitely <laughs> don't know. I mean, you know, Jens Stoltenberg uh, has decided after two extensions to step down, but it's an open field because, yes, Ben Wallace, his name is there. I've also heard the name of Ursula von der Leyen. Oh, wow. Uh, the uh, current uh, commission uh, president being uh, suggested. Uh, many in Central and Eastern Europe, Ed, who have been in NATO now for 20 years or so, probably think, hey, you know, we're, we're on the front line. Good point. Uh, we spend a lot of def on defence. Good Poland, point. We spend 3% on defence. Yeah. More than many of the Western Europeans, uh, yeah, exactly. it's our time. And uh, looking at Ursula von der Leyen, you also have to remember, Ed, we've not yet had a uh, a, a, a female yes. uh, a woman as Secretary General. We've had a female Deputy Secretary General, but many may think that it's also time for NATO to get into the 21st century when gender balance is concerned as well.